I'm Rob Trusinski. This is Symposium, where we talk about the intellectual foundations of a free society. And my guest today is someone for whom that is not an academic or theoretical matter. He is very close to the front lines of that battle between free society and dictatorship. Uh, my guest today is Yaroslav Romanchuk. Uh, thanks for coming on, Yaroslav. My honor to be with you. Hello. All right, so when we last talked, um, we talked about a year and a half ago about what was going on in Belarus because you were in Belarus. Uh, Yaroslav is, is and still is the president of the Scientific Research Mises Center, which is basically a, a pro-free market group, uh, uh, pro-liberty, uh, pro-free uh, uh, society group in Belarus. And you were talking about the uprising there and the, the impending crackdown from, from the authorities. And now I'm talking to you in Kiev, where you've gone to Ukraine, and, and in a way it's sort of been out of the frying pan and into the fire, as we say. Oh yeah, absolutely. And nobody could expect that things would uh, turn that badly if you listen to CNN and uh, East and uh, Western media. And this is uh, really uh, unexpected because the war has been going on in Ukraine for. Uh, six, seven years. Uh, it started in 2014 by a Russian invasion and then, then the grabbing of the Crimea and occupying Donbass and Lugansk regions. And uh, that was the status for since that time. And suddenly, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we heard a very intense information campaign, primarily from the United States and uh, a few Western European media saying that, oh, there is imminent danger that Russia is about to invade, that war can start any time. And uh, last uh, couple of days, we heard that from uh, President uh, uh, Biden, from different people as high as State Secretary and CIA people saying that Russia, you know, uh, uh, well, we have like information sort of intelligence that it would uh, stop. So uh, people who are in the military, people who are in intelligence here in this part of the world state that nothing changed in the borders of Ukraine. Uh, moreover, we have uh, in September, we had more troops concentrated at the uh, Ukrainian-Russian border than we had now. We had like 130,000, which is definitely not enough to have any meaningful wide-scale invasion in Ukraine to say nothing about occupying Kiev. Ukraine is uh, not a small country, one million people. That's a country of around 41 million people. And uh, unlike 2014, uh, Ukraine has uh, more, more or less modern uh, military, which is over 200,000 people. And recently there was a poll that uh, over half a million people are ready to defend the country in the form of uh, voluntary uh, platoons, voluntary units. So Ukraine is uh, has uh, resources, has people, has uh, will to defend it's uh, from the Russian invasion, if it happened. Uh, Russia itself, uh, Putin and other people said, no, we are not going to invade. We don't know what this hysteria uh, is coming from, why, and what the resources or sources of that. So we now uh, enter the area of speculation because we are trying to understand why Biden administration and why American media are so uh, actively involved in this uh, hysteria that uh, the first date was yesterday, 15th of, uh, um, oh, no, no, 12th, 13th of uh, February. It was supposed to be the date and time of the invasion. It never happened. Unlike uh, a couple of dates in the past, like uh, Christmas, 25th of December, other dates were mentioned that Russia all is uh, was ready to, uh, to invade and never happened. Uh, I was in Kharkiv, which is uh, 35 miles to Russia uh, 10 days ago, and uh, I saw firsthand the situation was no different than it was like seven, five, three years ago. Uh, the military uh, is there, it uh, is in the constant alert, so there is not, nothing like uh, compared to 1939 or 1941 uh, when uh, Hitler invaded 
Soviet Union at that time and or Poland, uh, no concentration of troops, no necessary moves to do that. Uh, so now we should speculate why on earth it is going on because all Americans, many foreigners got information here that you must leave Ukraine within uh, like 48 hours because there will be imminent invasion and that will be very big uh, problems for you to live uh, uh, well, uh, later. I believe that uh, this kind of campaign uh, is uh, being held to divert attention from a couple of things in the US policies and US foreign policy in general. First of all, Afghanistan, uh, which was a big, big screw up for the Biden administration. Then we have an uh, economic situation which is not uh, in good shape, though we have uh, over 7% GDP growth in America, but we have inflation, which is the highest in 40 years. Uh, we do not have any, um, well, not, not we, but Biden administration is not that popular. And uh, they argue that uh, there are people who are sympathetic to Putin agenda in the Biden administration. So they try to force uh, uh, Ukrainian government into uh, submitting to so-called Minsk agreement, which is in fact the way to dismantle to uh, to get rid of Ukraine as we know it right now. Uh, when this side, when this agreement was signed in 2014 or 2015, uh, that was uh, when the Russian military was occupying Donbass and uh, Lugansk, and it was like an under military threat. And that was uh, signed uh, in the way that it could be interpreted in the opposite way. The Ukrainian part interpret that as uh, first Russia should uh, demilitarize eastern part of Ukraine and then uh, we will uh, hold election. While Russia said, no, 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 let's hold election as uh, we stay right now, as formally we are not involved in the conflict, that's just a civil war, nothing else. Uh, predominantly 75% of Ukrainians are against uh, Minsk agreement. So whoever signs this piece of paper will be out of power within one week. And everybody knows it. President Zelensky knows it. Prime Minister knows it. There is an absolute consensus in the Ukrainian society and political elite that this kind of agreement is not acceptable. What we hear from Biden, from uh, Germans, from French, Italians, that this is the only way to go forward. So obviously we have this conflict uh, not between just Ukrainian policymakers and uh, policymakers from the West, but also who essentially are you, uh, well, these Western and, like, and American policymakers are somehow taking sides of Russia aggressor. But also, that would definitely mean the conflict between Ukrainians, as I said, 75% are against this agreement, and the rest of the world. I mean, not all like Poles, Lithuanians. Uh, British people, Turks are sympathetic to the position of uh, Ukraine, while America, Germany, France definitely are not. And so we see different division lines. It's not about peace or war. That's something that we are witnessing and some people believe that it's for the first time that American media and mainstream media are involved in this kind of mass scale propaganda efforts conducted by Biden administration. So we kind of in a new situation, new water. <laughs> and uh, that is why it's very important to deliver uh, true messages from the ground to um, our American colleagues and friends and all people worldwide. War has been on for eight years and there is nothing different. Uh, Putin definitely would like to use Americans and Western Europeans to force Ukrainian people into this uh, agreement, which would definitely mean the end of Ukraine as we know. Uh, and in addition, uh, as we know, Putin uh, urged and forced Biden to agree on Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, uh, which was is still considered by many uh, members of European Union to be an energy threat used by Gazprom and Russia 
to uh, blackmail Europeans by very, very high gas prices, which reached like $2,000 per cubic meters, 1,000 cubic meters uh, just a couple of months ago. So Russia uses all sorts of uh, means to wage war. We are in the state of uh, information warfare, uh, psychological warfare. Uh, a couple of, uh, of parts of Ukraine are under pressure. We have over 30,000 troops located in Belarus now, now, and some experts argue that it could be uh, a means to occupy and to merge not Ukraine, but Belarus. So uh, Russia is getting more and more aggressive because it uses all kinds of means of uh, waging war and it uh, uses its soft power and blackmail and, uh, and uh, bluffing in order to, to get what it wants. And somehow American administration is part of this bluffing game. So, so uh, uh, to get it clear, you, you regard, see, the reason why there's a lot of talk here in the U.S. about war being imminent there is there is a massive buildup of Russian troops. And Russia has certain advantages. It has an advantage in air power, especially, which would make a, a defense of Ukraine very difficult. So do you regard it simply as a giant Russian bluff in order to get through diplomacy what they can't get otherwise? Uh, not Russian, but American bluff, because uh, Russian uh, media and Russian president and Russian uh, spokesman to president say that we're not going to invade. Well, Somehow but, but wait a minute. The information wait a minute. comes from... CNN. But, but the, mes and, the message uh, comes from, but, uh, can I just say that the message comes from the, the troop buildup uh, on the borders of Ukraine. The fact that he's pouring massive amounts of, of military material, things like that, making it look as Bro, if there's that, that's the point. Yeah, that's the point. Uh, as I said, today we have 130,000 troops at the border of Ukraine and Russia. In September, we had over 250,000, nobody cared and nobody cried wolf and said about the invasion. So this kind of concentration definitely is not enough to have a full-fledged war and the occupation of, of, uh, of Ukraine. And everybody knows it. If you are not a military expert, but I hear many generals, people who are involved in analyzing different military operations, and they argue that, well, well, that was... This is the state. They do that in order to uh, divert attention. They do that in order to uh, put constant psychological pressure on Ukraine that we are there. But that is not something that happened within the last six months or something in order to prove that this is a buildup that is going to happen. And the only way to, uh, to interpret that is that the war is coming. The only difference is that we have... Uh, 30,000 troops uh, are located in Belarus from Russia, but this like a maneuver, and this is uh, more of a danger to Belarus than to Ukraine. So what is, what is Putin actually trying to accomplish with this? Uh, the, the, well, different people, different countries have different reasons. Uh, first, Russia definitely wants to have Minsk agreement signed and implemented by Ukrainian government, because in, uh, that would mean that uh, we, Eastern part of uh, Ukraine would be uh, de facto Russian Federation, and that would be the end of uh, Ukraine as a unitary state that will be confederation, and that's what one, Russia wants. Russia wants to uh, break Ukraine into pieces. Secondly, Russia wants the whole world to forget about the Crimea, that the Crimea is uh, part of uh, Russia right now, according to Russia's version, International law states it clearly, and uh, United States and Germany and France state openly that the Crimea is uh, uh, belongs to Ukraine. So uh, Russia wants to these things, and and uh, additionally, Russia wants to uh, wage operations and to weaken Ukraine economically, psychologically, uh, and support some forces inside Ukraine that would uh, create more and more conflict. The position of Germany is very clear, and uh, it wants uh, North Pipe the second. It wants uh, to have uh, trade with Russia. It's just real politics, nothing else. Uh, the position of, uh, of uh, France, French president, is that they are involved in French presidential election campaign, 
Uh, Macron wants to show that he can deliver help to Putin. He is like a peacemaker and our arbiter in uh, the foreign affairs after Angela Merkel left. He is like the senior politician in this part of the world. Uh, and then we have Biden administration and the American administration in general. What it wants is still a uh, 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 question mark, but we can speculate what it wants that it uh, has been conducting uh, talks with the Putin administration. It has been doing things that Trump never, never did. Though many people expected and suspected Trump of being pro-Russian, but right now we see many, many things conducted by CIA boss and state secretary that they are uh, kind of much closer to the Russian position than, uh, than uh, any other presidential, presidential administration in the past. So, so you, you see them as, as something as, that is. You see them as, as trying to push Ukraine into yeah, signing. Yeah, I see the that. That's what's going on, and uh, many people from State Department, uh, President, uh, President Biden, State Secretary uh, Blinken, they all stated that uh, Minsk Agreement is the only uh, frame for uh, solving a conflict uh, in Ukraine. And this is the case. So what Russia wants, Russia doesn't want sanctions. Russia wants uh, to have free trade, doesn't want to have any restrictions on its money, capital. So in this case, Russia says, well, it's not us. We are ready to uh, deliver on Minsk agreement. That's Ukraine is to blame. So remove all sanctions from us. And this is what uh, could, be, could happen if Biden uh, coordinates or somehow associates with the Instagram position of Moscow, not Kiev. Right. So what do you think that, that Ukraine needs to do? I mean, they you say, you, you think that the Russians don't have the ability to invade. Now, the history on this is that Ukraine did not have a very effective armed, a large or effective armed force back in 2014 because, you know, uh, uh, the Yanukovych, the, the leader at the time of Ukraine, yeah. was essentially you know, trying to turn it into a Soviet client state, or excuse me, Russian client state, but really, you know, reconstituting the old Soviet Union. And uh, he was deliberately keeping Ukraine, you know, weak and unable to challenge Russia. Uh, there's, but there's been a massive buildup. But what needs to be done more to make Ukraine into uh, strong enough to deter Russian aggression? So right now, another question is Ukraine is that Ukraine is not weak, in, not strong enough, it doesn't have military capacity to uh, wage war against Russia and to free the Crimea and to free Donetsk and Donbass, uh, Donetsk, Donbass region from Russian military and occupation. So in this case, there is a kind of a conflict as uh, we have like Palestine and Israel, we have Northern and uh, Cyprus and Cyprus, we have uh, like uh, those big things, a big conflict that cannot be solved within like five or three days or five years or whatever. It needs uh, some time for both parties to see what's going on. So the best way to move forward, as again, there's a consensus among uh, Ukrainian elite and the many people who come here and know the situation from the ground, agree with that. So uh, strengthening uh, military capacity of Ukraine is one thing. Ru Again, I said Russia, Ukrainian army definitely is much stronger than it was even five years ago. It's much better equipped, much better trained. And uh, President Zelensky said that uh, from um, April or May, it will, not, it will be a voluntary army. It won't be a conscript army, which again, probably would definitely boost its morale. And to add, uh, to add to the force of, uh, of Ukraine, we have, again, as I said, over half a million Ukrainians already willing to fight if they are equipped, if they have guns, if uh, they are coordinated and integrated into the uh, capacity to defend the country. So uh, there will be a long time, long uh, going on standoff between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, the only way to move forward would be to abolish the Minsk agreement altogether, as the legal framework doesn't have any perspective. It is viewed by most of Ukrainians, like 75% of Ukrainians, as something unjust and uh, dangerous to Ukraine. While Russia catches up with that, and it managed to get a Biden administration on board as the only legal framework, and the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Russia uh, Lavrov was very happy 
to have Minsk agreement as the only uh, agreement, a only foundation for negotiation in the future, because instead it's one in this form. So uh, let the, the conflict remain as it is, and then we'll see what will going, what will happen to Russia in Russia with Putin, and uh, what Ukraine really needs is full fledged free market reforms. And uh, this month, uh, we, my colleagues and I, my, my, my kind of contribution to uh, peace and prosperity of Ukraine, we uh, drafted a uh, comprehensive first in the history of Ukraine uh, liberal program reforms, meaning liberal, not in the American sense of the word, but liberal, classical liberal, uh, which uh, includes uh, monetary reform, which includes tax reform, social security reform, privatization, governance, all necessary, like a 150 page document that uh, will be considered by all bodies of power, all stakeholders. So if we uh, uh, persuade the government and the civil society business community to accept it, then the uh, uh, Ukrainian economy will uh, um, will deliver a six to nine percent annual GDP growth for at least twenty years. And if it does that, then nobody in the Musk, the Minsk region, and the Crimea would want to stay within totalitarian state of Russia. It will be uh, a very good example to follow. And this is the only way to for us to move forward. It's like conflict between North Korea and South Korea. Everybody knows that South Korea is uh, a much better case than totalitarian military South North Korea, but North Korea is still there with all its power. Uh, there are many signs that Russia would definitely get much weaker if uh, oil and gas prices are down and if uh, the world will have much more competition in energy goods. And that will ha happen in the next five years so if we have uh, economic reforms, if we have a uh, small government in Ukraine, unlike it was 10 years ago, and if we have understanding of the West, not like uh, taking part in propaganda and threatening campaign that now uh, is taking uh, very unusual forms and it kills trust to Western media and Western politicians, then Ukraine would handle. And uh, now we have this uh, interesting new probably uh, military political axis consisting of Great Britain, Poland, Lithuania, Turkey, where uh, unlike NATO, uh, people, they have uh, consultants uh, on the ground. So probably we are witnessing uh, emerging, the emergence of new kind of uh, alliances to beat and to, to somehow uh, challenge uh, brutal uh, totalitarian Kremlin regime and uh, the Russian regime, which is also uh, taking sides with the Kremlin. So uh, yeah, the, the British involvement I find very interesting because they, I think they're motivated by the fact that there were a series of assassinations that were carried out by, by the Russians against uh, you know, Russians who were in Britain uh, and some you know, British people as well. And they sort of view it as this is an attempt by Russia. I think that sort of woke up the British, that, that Russia is not content. The Putin regime is not content to just have a dictatorship within their own sphere. They're trying to expand that outward. And I, I sort of see that as being the reason why Putin has this obsession with Ukraine. I mean, he's talked about Ukraine as part of historical Russia and basically made a claim to the yeah, whole thing. Absolutely. And I think you're an example of that, that uh, you know, that somebody from Belarus, you know, when, when the regime cracks down in Belarus, it's relatively easy for you to go to Ukraine and set up there in Ukraine. There's a lot of Russian speakers. There's a lot of cultural connections. It's very close by. I think he sees that as uh, the reason why Ukraine is such a big threat is it's basically a, uh, a, a haven for dissent against his own regime. One thing is descendants. And uh, on the other hand, Putin sees Ukraine is the only democratic free country. If Ukraine succeeds, that would be the end of his uh, imperialistic dream. That would be the end of his uh, story that Soviet Union was such a big success and collapse of the Soviet Union, the biggest historical tragedy. That's what he's saying. So essentially, if Ukraine manages to hold uh, free market reforms to build uh, governance, institutions to integrate into the free world and become what I call New West, then uh, the whole 
kind of ideology underneath Putin regime would collapse. And Putin realizes that because uh, the reason he wants the weak and uh, authoritarian Belarus, a fragmented oligarchic Ukraine, is that, well, based on uh, in this kind of context, he looks kind of okay. He's got oil, wealth, he's got billions of dollars, he's got uh, that's what he doesn't talk much about 100 people who own over 80% of all Russian assets. And we have got this, all these people, you know, they uh, extracted and uh, sent to the West over about $2 trillion. So that's, uh, they view Russia, and that's kind of the merger of uh, intelligence, of uh, mafia, and of, uh, of uh, the military in one like bottle. Uh, uh, the kind of uh, the, the pasture for these parasites to get rich, to send their kids abroad. They have uh, real estate in Italy, in London, and they mm -hmm. have re uh, bank accounts in America, all over the world. So on the other hand, that's kind of the big game. And they want uh, to restore the case when uh, Russia or the Soviet Union at that time, that was like 3.5% of world, world GDP, but uh, we, everybody talked about bipolar world. So Soviet Union, communism on the one hand, and capitalism in the United States. Now, having even less GDP, 1.7%, Russia and Putin wants to use uh, information warfare, psychological warfare. Putin now had bought a lot of politicians like Germany, Italy, France. A lot of people are on the pay list of, uh, of uh, the Kremlin. And uh, using uh, much less resources, Putin wants to uh, state that he is on the equal footing with Biden, with uh, uh, German chancellor or with French president. And that's it's still uh, a big uh, thing, a big question why the Biden administration is playing Putin's game, not vice versa. Because right now we see that there's an aggressor and uh, Putin doesn't hide his agenda. He's very open about it. But somehow Biden and uh, is uh, leaning closer to the German Chancellor Schroeder, who now is on uh, Gazprom uh, pay list, rather than to freedom fighters worldwide. The thing that you just sketched out about why Putin doesn't want a successful example so close to his doorstep, so close culturally and geographically, uh, sort of in the Russian sphere, the great successful example of a, of a, of a free nation. That's what makes me more alarmist on this, that he might actually be crazy enough to start a war uh, just to prevent that, that he has such a deep, that gives him such a deep sense of insecurity. So I have a question, what if you're wrong? What if there actually is a conflict? What if they actually do attempt an invasion? If he invades it, uh, before that, Putin was very, very cautious of what kind of campaigns he got involved in. Uh, in Georgia, well, the odds of his losing were very, very small because of the size of Georgia. In uh, Belarus, well, there is also this information uh, campaign and gas and oil and this uh, Belarus is quite different. In Ukraine, if we hypothetically presume uh, there was invasion, that would be bloody, it would be bloody, it, many uh, people would be lost. But again, that would be uh, the war when Ukrainians for the first time would start shooting Russia. In 2014, the idea that Ukrainians could shoot at Russians was like alien. Oh, well, we are so we are together. We serve the same army, and it was how could you be our enemy? Uh, that's a big moral and psychological difference. So Ukrainians are determined to fight to defend its its motherland, its country, and even if it takes like a year or something, that would uh, be war, but uh, I'm sure that Ukraine would prevail because there is no uh, justification for Russian invasion. So it's not Ukrainian, the Ukraine, that is, Ukraine that is invading Russia and bombing Russian cities. It will be a Russia. And many people in Russia would be anti, uh, anti uh, against this war. As we had this uh, general, one of the generals, uh, who was close to communists? He said that why we don't understand why this the the Kremlin is uh, igniting war with Ukraine, which is very close to us. So many many people, and uh, if dozens of thousands of Russians uh, were shot here in Ukraine, that would also create a big big pressure on right on, on Putin because Putin now he's got like 30 35 percent popularity. 
Uh, many Russians hate hate Putin because he's been in power for too long, and he created lucrative uh, positions for oligarchs, for billionaires, for oil barons, for all kinds of people who don't care about lives of Russians or Ukrainians or Americans. And this is like when uh, there was Soviet Union and this uh, Second World War. That was the war against fascism, against Nazism, uh, liberation war. And if Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, that would be a liberation war for Ukrainians. That would definitely boost the morale. And again, uh, do, uh, many people uh, explain, uh, uh, well, describe Russian military, Russian army as, uh, as a very inefficient uh, command, a very low uh, equipment and a very low quality, like uh, ships cannot move properly, tanks, uh, uh, you know, are broken very often. And again, morale. So if Russian soldiers came here, what, what, why are they here? What would Russian propaganda say? That uh, there are like fascists here in Ukraine? It's just, it's a joke. So uh, again, if war started, I think there will be the uh, last war Russian Empire uh, conducted in this uh, century because that will lead to collapse of Russia itself, which is, uh, again, federation built on uh, Russian force and no, uh, well, true uh, decentralization and, uh, and, uh, and power. Th that's why Putin weighing all these pros and cons, and he is not probably not the only one who, who uh, takes part in decision-making, would definitely uh, consider um, kind of a coup d'etat inside Russia or even uh, uh, attempts on his life or there will be many people who say, well, we make billionaires not uh, to uh, waste them in a war that is, uh, will never be a winning war for us. So there are many other things, but if the, many people in Ukraine argue that if Russia invaded, that would be the final like clear up or catharsis for, you know, for the West to get rid of the Russian danger for, for many, many more years to come. So I, I think part of the reason though that for my concern and, and for other people's concern is I think this is also a wake up call to the NATO powers, to the extent to which they are not really prepared to resist Russia or to deter Russia. Uh, that we don't have, uh, haven't been spending enough, we haven't been putting enough of our military forward in those areas that, that we don't have the, that especially in Germany and places like that are not even politically prepared to, to mount any kind of pushback against Russia. So I think it's, a, it's been a, a, a warning about the potential weakness of, of NATO and of the NATO powers. Oh, absolutely. NATO, NATO uh, some people argue here that uh, this kind of behavior of Russia uh, gave a rebirth to NATO because NATO somehow uh, gained some uh, some sense of existence, raison d'etre, and that is why you know many people believe that well, if NATO did not intervene, then we have Great Britain, we have Poland, and Polish people and Lithuanian Baltic states they see clearly that uh, well they know Russia that Russia is an heir of the Soviet Union, so it it's, uh, it doesn't hide its aggression aggressive nature. So in this case, what uh, Ukraine would expect from NATO and the West is just not to take sides with the aggressor, not to be part of this uh, information uh, propaganda campaign, and just to deliver assistance in uh, economic areas, in uh, financial areas, and not to scare people off. Because right now we have a situation where many investors say, well, well uh, we, we will not go even travel uh, to Ukraine, but that's dangerous. But again, people who are in Ukraine are really, bit, they, they wonder why on earth the Biden administration has been doing that because they do not see this imminent danger. And even again, in 2014, uh, the reaction of uh, the American administration was different when there was real war uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine. Now um, the situation is much more different, much more favorable to Ukraine and this kind of hysteria around. And this is again, that. Uh, that would raise the issue of credibility to the Western media, Western politicians, what kind of game they're involved in. And again, if uh, they're involved in something that Ukrainian government and Ukrainian authorities don't, don't have, don't fathom, uh, then that they, they should share this kind of information. Because recently, like two days ago, CNN uh, uh, reported that the whole 
behavior of Biden administration was to kind of scare Russians off. So that, that was, it's not that they see the imminent danger of invasion, they wanted to kind of uh, beat Russians in information warfare in this part of the world, which again, that's just, you know, that's ridiculous. So you see, from, from the perspective of Eastern Europe and Ukraine, they see the Biden administration as being sort of trying to force you into appeasing Russia, in effect. In effect. Yeah, absolutely. Appeasing Russia. And again, we had uh, on, uh, very suspicious talks of uh, uh, CIA boss in Moscow. We have very uh, uh, unusual uh, statements of uh, State Secretary Blinken. We have a lot of uh, statements of uh, top American officials to force uh, Ukrainian authorities into signing Minsk agreement, which is again, should be abolished altogether because that kind of document was signed uh, under military pressure 2014, 2015, and it cannot be uh, considered as a valid document for implementation, especially right now. I understand Germans and French, they have a different agenda. They are under very heavy Russian uh, influence but somehow, after uh, Biden took over, uh, Russia was very sympathetic to the United States joining this format, Normandy format, in order to, again, to negotiate uh, the outcome of the situation. But in this case, uh, the best uh, outcome for us would be to, again, to abolish Minsk agreement altogether and to uh, go on uh, with reforms in Ukraine, merely expanding and... and uh, enforcing military uh, power of Ukraine and see whether Russia would be ready for uh, any meaningful uh, negotiation. So far, it doesn't want to negotiate. It wants just to humiliate Ukraine and to have a say in the international affairs and to, again, restore what you said, historic Russia. Yeah, and, and Russia has a long-standing history of, of the sort of frozen conflict approach, which is anything on their borders when there's, yeah. they, they see ideological competition of some kind they they create a conflict that then just sort of simmers forever and it's there to cause turmoil and to prevent the com the country from yeah, becoming strong and independent and you so you think that yeah, rather than invasion point. rather than invasion this is really like a permanent sort of frozen conflict thing yeah, to create absolutely. To put, put ukraine in a state of permanent turmoil turmoil to prevent it from yeah. becoming strong and uh growing and, and becoming a, a better and again what should what Russia is achieving is to show to the world that the West is weak, the NATO is this uh, fragmented, it doesn't want, it doesn't have guts enough to show strength. The uh, American uh, Biden administration is again somehow hesitant. So Russia wants to not to be a partner with the West, it wants to destroy the West. It wants to show to the world that, well, it has power, it has guts, it can uh, manipulate. And again, we have China, which is definitely uh, as a silent uh, observer of the whole conflict. And again, instead of, uh, if, and if uh, again, China, if Russia invades uh, Ukraine and the American government and NATO allows it, then uh, I do not see any reason why China would not invade Taiwan. And right. again, in Taiwan, that's a big thing, and that will be another uh, testing ground or like a litmus test for United States and NATO to see whether it would step in and defend Taiwan against Chinese invasion. And China, well, it stated clearly that within like two or three uh, years, uh, it will do that. So again, uh, maybe this kind of uh, game Russia is playing is just to divert attention from the uh, Chinese-Taiwanese conflict. Well, yeah, I think that's the, the thing is that America needs to sort of wake up to the fact that there are these things happening and that we need to deter them. And, and you're, you're complaining a lot about the, the Biden administration trying to force Ukraine into the Minsk agreement. The other danger I see is there's a lot of people on the right in America who are basically saying, well, why should we get involved? Who cares about Ukraine? Russia has a right to its sphere of influence. You know, we're having them, there, there have been people saying, well, if they end up being Finlandized, that's not such a bad solution and i think the Finns disagree with that but um uh so can that, that just sort of get into this quest question of you know the biggest problem i think that that you have to come up against is simply getting americans to care about what's going on uh you know out, 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 outside of our borders and around the world and especially right now when there's a very sort of attitude of all oh, we should just look inward and not really be involved we should withdraw from afghanistan we should withdraw here and there so why why should america care about ukraine 
what it, why is it important? It's like America, Americans. Uh, I think that uh, we should have a uh, different uh, distinction between America and America, American administration, America. American uh, have always cared about freedom and liberty. They support freedom and liberty worldwide. It's supported against totalitarianism, authoritarianism, imperialism, and that we're supportive of these ideas worldwide, and we are really grateful for that. American government uh, is a different story. Right now, the, uh, it's not that uh, Ukrainians ask Americans to come and fight against Russians here. They don't do that. It's just, you know, but stating and sticking to a value-based policy is what uh, Ukrainians needed most. If we are for freedom, if we are against uh, aggressor, if we're against tyrants, state it openly. So don't play games with dictator. Don't play games with tyrants. That's what is moral opportunism. That is moral treachery. That's how many people see America right now because of this kind of dealing with dictators, dealing with tyrants, dealing with bad guys, instead of dealing with people who are freedom fighters. That is why, you know, it's uh, likewise for Germany, Italy, French. The West now uh, is losing or has lost a lot of its uh, value attraction. In 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, for us, America was like a beacon of uh, all the gold that was part you could imagine. Right now, when we see what's going on, that's like all opportunistic. That's all, oh, well, let's go for a green planet. It's much more important than, uh, than uh, tyrants, than uh, military, than aggressor, aggression. So uh, 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 modern uh, ideologues, especially those who work and associate themselves with the uh, UN, with World Economic Forum, with all kinds of left-wing agendas, they would love to hold this uh, global agenda, COVID against COVID, uh, global warming is global warming, cows who fought too much to create gases, uh, greedy corporations, they must be tamed. And so this global agenda is a cover-up for all kinds of tyrant worldwide. And we want America to uh, recognize that and to, again, to go back to the basics of, uh, of its constitution, freedom, property, and pursuit of happiness for everybody worldwide. What is your plan for what uh, you think is going to happen in the next year? I mean, do you think that Russia is just going to keep a permanent buildup here, sort of to keep the pot stirred? Or do you think they'll eventually, uh, uh, if it does not work, if, it, if they're not able to force Ukraine into a bad agreement, that they will just simply begin to slowly pull away? Uh, Russia would uh, keep forces uh, at the perimeter of uh, Ukrainian borders, no doubt about it. Russia will uh, stay in Belarus and will use Belarus as its ally to threaten and to put pressure on uh, Baltic states and Poland, essentially to, uh, to demonstrate uh, to its own people, to like domestic policy, that we are there in order to defend our traditional values from the greedy, uh, immoral West, as this is the uh, moral uh, ideology or morality or ideology of, uh, of uh, Putin and Lukashenko. They, uh, in their propaganda, they pursue the message that they are being attacked, not vice versa. That is why they will keep the military there and uh, at the border of Ukraine not uh, as a sign of, uh, of being uh, built up to invade Ukraine, but also like to show to the people from uh, in their own countries that they are doing that to pr protect their, the forces of the good, to not to let evil into their countries. So that will stay and then much will depend on the economic situation in the world, much will depend on the political uh, situation, especially in Russia. And in my understanding, in Putin regime will erode uh, eventually, uh, Putin will very have difficult times in 2024, and uh, Ukraine must not uh, waste time for like for, for the old ways of uh, imitating reforms. That is why we will definitely push much harder with uh, if, if, uh, free market reform proposals. We will uh, consult consolidate uh, political forces, we will definitely strengthen uh, the think tank, 
component in Ukraine in order to consolidate all free market thinkers. And if we uh, achieve that, definitely Ukraine would uh, be uh, uh, one of the best reformers in the region in the next 10 years. Again, there are, there's a lot of resistance. All guys, all the guards around, you know, a lot of Russian spies, agents of influence. So all these things must be uh, somehow sorted out. And if we do that, uh, somewhere like within five, 10 years, probably, there will be uh, this Crimea and Donbass region on the agenda. Uh, President Zelensky and I initiated so-called the Crimea platform, which unites 46 countries, which urge Russia to uh, get back to the international order and uh, get uh, the Crimea back. It will not likely to happen uh, very quickly, but uh, Ukrainian role, Ukraine uh, definitely wants to uh, all these issues to stay on the international agenda. And that's uh, definitely where we'd concentrate our efforts. As free marketeers, we have colleagues here from different areas. We've been cooperating uh, with the uh, international community. Now, when I last talked to you, just to wrap up, when I last talked to you, uh, you were fairly optimistic about what was going to happen in Belarus. And obviously, things did not go well there, that, that there was a crackdown and then now there's the Russian troops yeah. in there. I mean, I think you can view that as essentially a Russian occupation of Belarus uh, in order to keep uh, Lukashenko in power. Uh, so uh, do you think things are going to get worse before they're going to get better? Uh, in Belarus, definitely things would get worse. Uh, it, uh, Belarus will never have uh, as much resources as in 2021. It was a very favorable year for the Russian economy. But again, uh, either Putin wants and, and the Russian oligarchs want to take over uh, Belarusian assets, no doubt about it. And Lukashenko doesn't have any legitimacy, credibility, any idea what to do with Belarus. So there will be many, many more tensions. And the only thing that he can sell to Russia, to the Kremlin, is war against the West. And everybody understands that Lukashenko will not wage any war, but that's his rhetoric. So I think that, again, and uh, freeing Belarus and freeing Russia will definitely uh, depend much on what is going on in Ukraine. If we deliver the concentrate efforts, then Ukraine would be a showcase and that would erode moral grounds of Russian and the Belarusian regimes. Well, I certainly hope that you're right and that that uh, Putin is not actually crazy enough to to invade, try to invade Ukraine. Uh, I think we'll have some idea in the next couple of weeks as to whether or not that's really going to happen or whether it's going to be just a, a permanent yeah, show. Of course. Um, so I, I, I hope that the outcome uh, turns out well. And I hope that this is sort of an awakening to the West to realize I think it's been so long since we had this sense of a big geopolitical rival. Uh, you know, since the end of the Cold War, the idea of a, you had a, a, a and Putin has recreated a, a sort of a, a quasi ideology of authoritarianism. He started to create alliances with yep. China and other dictatorships. And this idea of he's trying to make himself into a geopolitical rival to the United States with this tiny on top of this tiny little economy. Um, so I think it's, it's been so long since we've had to deal with anything like that, that we're just not really prepared for that mindset. And I'm hoping that's a wake up to us to take it seriously and to no, but, stand for Yeah. But then the idea of rivalry is ridiculous because you have the country which is 1.7 GDP of uh, the world. 1.7 just, you know, it, uh, it's, rich uh, it's rich people accumulate wealth in the West. They are wholly dependent on uh, Western technologies. Uh, they deal with the West, their children live there, they study there. So it's, there's no ideology there, but you know, to, uh, to have this uh, sphere of influence. So the only thing that the American West should do is just not to buy this bluffing Russia has been uh, uh, generating for so many years to say that, well, that it has some unique things to deliver. Uh, well, it has nuclear weapons, and definitely it's, uh, you should talk about that as it could use that. But again, while talking is not like, uh, well, succumbing to or uh, giving up to its rhetoric and to its greed and to its uh, immorality. Well, thanks for talking to me and, and sharing your perspective. Thank you. I'm Rob Strzinski. This is Symposium. You can find us at symposium.substack.com. Uh, you can also like our YouTube channel, uh, which helps us out a great deal in our traffic. Uh, thank you for joining the conversation.